If God predestines his people to be conformed to the image of his son, according to Romans 8, 29, and if he elects us before the foundation of the world that we may be holy, according to Ephesians 1, 4, then it is clear that God intends someday to fill the earth with the beauty of holiness. A world filled with people who reflect the infinite worth of the transcendent fullness of God. A world of people created and recreated in his image. A world that is full of the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. A world radiant with the beauty of holiness. That's what he intends to do. And I know that for some of us, the concept of holiness or the beauty of holiness is so new or indistinct or cluttered with old associations that it may be very hard for you to feel the wonder of what I mean when I speak of the beauty of holiness filling the earth like the waters cover the sea. So I thought I would read to you that quote from Jonathan Edwards because though Edwards lived in a world so amazingly different from most people because of what he saw in God, I find this quote to be ravishing. We drink in a strange notion of holiness from our childhood as if it were a melancholy, morose, sour, and unpleasant thing. But there is nothing in it but what is sweet and ravishingly lovely. Tis the highest beauty and amiableness, vastly above all other beauties. Tis a divine beauty, makes the soul heavenly and far purer than anything here on earth. Tis of a sweet, pleasant, charming, lovely, amiable, delightful, serene, calm, still nature. Tis almost too high a beauty for any creatures to be adorned with. It makes the soul a little sweet and delightful image of the blessed Jehovah. Oh, how many angels stand with pleased delighted, charmed eyes and look and look with smiles of pleasure upon their lips, upon the soul that is holy. How many, how may they hover over such a soul to delight, to behold such loveliness. What a sweet calmness, what a calm ecstasy doth it bring to the soul. How doth it make the soul love itself? How doth it make the pure, invisible world love it? Yea, how doth God love it and delight in it? How do even the whole creation, the sun, the fields, the trees, the love, love a humble holiness? How doth all the world congratulate, embrace, and sing to a sanctified soul? It makes the soul like a delightful field or garden planted by God where Jesus is the sun. The blessed beams and calm breeze are the Holy Spirit, the sweet and delightful flowers and the pleasant shrill music of little birds are the Christian graces. Oh, like a little white flower, pure, unspotted and undefiled, low and humble, pleasing and harmless, receiving the beams, the pleasant beams of the serene sun, gently, 
moved and a a little shaken by a breeze, rejoicing as it were in a calm rapture, diffusing around a most delightful fragrancy, standing most peacefully and lovingly in the midst of all the other flowers around about. Some people have seen the beauty of holiness. And I want you to. And I want to. What is it? It is, as we have seen, in God, the beauty of holiness in God is the infinite worth of his transcendent Trinitarian fullness along with the perfect harmony between that infinite worth and all of his feelings and all of his thoughts and all of his actions. None of God's acts contradicts the supreme value of his transcendent fullness. There is perfect consistency. Without exception, Without interruption, God's acts perfectly express the infinite worth of the transcendent Trinitarian fullness of God. The beauty of God's holiness is his perfect harmony, the perfect harmony between all that God does and the infinite value of all that he is. The beauty of holiness in God is the perfect harmony harmony between all that God does and the infinite value of all that God is. Harmony. In us, therefore, the beauty of holiness is similar. Be holy, for I am holy, we saw. God disciplines us that we may share his holiness. And therefore, the beauty of our holiness is the harmony between all of our thoughts and all of our feelings and all of our actions and the infinite worth of the transcendent Trinitarian fullness of God. When our lives gladly express the value of God's all-satisfying fullness, we are holy. We are beautiful. The only thing ugly in the world, the only thing bad in the world, in fact, the meaning of ugliness and the meaning of badness is the failure to reflect the infinite worth of God's transcendent fullness. That's the definition of bad, wrong, evil, ugly. The failure to express gladly and fully the infinite value of the transcendent Trinitarian fullness of God. That's the meaning of bad. And the opposite is called holy. Wherever our emotions and our thoughts and our deeds show forth the infinite worth of God's transcendent Trinitarian fullness, we are holy. And the beauty of holiness is shining. Someday, that is what will fill the whole earth. This is my son's, my oldest son's 40th birthday. I was sitting on the couch this morning thinking about his growing up in that house. And I looked out the window at the magnificent yellow tree in my front yard. It's magnificent for about three days. (laughs) And there's a lesson in that. And it was beautiful. The sun was just blazingly bright on those leaves. 
And I thought, oh God, the beauty of holiness trying to break through on my life. You trying to say something to me this morning about the beauty of holiness that I long for all my children to know and all of you to know that someday that tree and what just was spectacularly beautiful to me this morning will be such a dim reflection of what is going to fill this earth like the waters cover the sea. God is going to fill the earth with the beauty of holiness by filling the earth with saints, holy ones. And they will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, Matthew thirteen forty three. You will shine like the sun in the kingdom of your Father. And all that is evil will be cast into outer darkness. And the new creation, the new universe will have nothing of sin in it. And no misery in it. And all the ransom church of God will be saved to sin no more. And be only holy. And what a beautiful society that will be. Paul speaks of it as the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Romans 8.21. Freedom from all sinning. Imagine it. Imagine it. You won't ever sin again. Not a thought, not a feeling, not a deed with any little increment of evil in it. And nobody around you will either. And there'll be no misery of any kind. Only the beauty of holiness, the perfect reflection and expression of the infinite value of the Trinitarian fullness of God. And then... The whole creation, he says there in Romans 8, the whole creation, not just the millions of saints who have been sanctified and glorified into the image of God, but all creation will be brought into the freedom of the glory of the children of God so that we have a playground called the universe suited for saints, sinless Saints. I'm eager. Hasten the day, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. So the new universe that we're moving toward is that there will be perfect harmony between the natural world and between the fullness of human life in the image of God and the infinite worth of the Trinitarian fullness of God. A perfect harmony which does not exist yet and that's why we're all as sick and sad and sorrowful as we are. Everything, every emotion, every thought, every action will testify to the infinite worth of God's transcendent fullness in the redeemed universe and it will be filled with the beauty of holiness. That's where we're going. That's the meaning in the end of sanctification. It will all be sanctified. It will be made holy. And it will satisfy and until then, we're in a grand process called sanctification or glorification or becoming holy as God is holy. And what I want to show in this message is that this process is a divine miracle in you that you are the actors of. Sanctification moving towards the sanctification of the universe where it is full of the beauty of holiness and the beauty of holiness fills the earth like the waters cover the sea. That's a miracle one by one, one by one. 
It's a miracle that God works in you and you act the miracle. That's what I want to show from the Bible. God is fully engaged in bringing your life and this world to its appointed destiny of holiness. Fully engaged. God is totally engaged in your life and in this world, bringing you and it to the appointed destiny of conformity to the Son of God or to holiness. And that full engagement of God is no limitation upon your full engagement in sanctification. Rather, instead of being a limitation upon your full engagement, God's full engagement is the creation of your full engagement. When you act the miracle, God did that. If you don't act the miracle of sanctification, there won't be any. God's sovereign enablement of holiness does not contradict the act of human duty. It creates it. What, when God opens the eyes of the blind, the blind are the ones who see. When God gives strength to shriveled legs, the lame do the walking. When God touches the ears of the deaf, it is the deaf who do the hearing. When God calls Lazarus from the grave, Lazarus walks out on his own two feet, one step at a human time. When God changes Zacchaeus' heart and makes it broken and generous, Zacchaeus is the one who gives back fourfold from those from whom he stole. When God fills you with compassion, you are the ones who exercise your will to feed the hungry and visit the sick and clothe the naked and take in the refugee. You do that miracle. When God gives you merciful humility, you turn the other cheek. When God inclines your heart to his word, you get out of bed one leg at a time and go to your Bible. When God gives you the courage to love, you share Christ with your neighbor. When God gives you a patient confidence in his timing, you keep the speed limit. Stop at stop signs. Buckle your belt. Yes, you do. When God is at work in you, the miracle of patience and confidence and his timing and not yours is right. When God makes you content with his provision, it's you who tell the truth on your tax returns. When God makes his glory more satisfying than lust, it is you who do not click that pornographic button. You don't. You don't. You don't. You work that miracle. When God has satisfied miraculously your soul on him. When God gives you a sweet satisfaction in your future reward, it is you who bless your enemies and do not curse them. God authors the miracle, you act the miracle. Or there is no miracle. 
called sanctification. Here's the way Edwards put it. I hope you do not wonder any longer why I read Jonathan Edwards. Why wouldn't you visit the top of Mount Everest if it's on your shelf, for goodness sakes? 27 volumes. We are not merely passive in it, nor yet does God do some and we do the rest. But God does all and we do all. God produces all, we act all. For this is what he produces, our acts. God is the only proper author and fountain. We are the proper actors. We are in different respects, wholly passive and wholly active. End quote. Now that is what I want to shed light on from the Bible. Don't want you to believe it because Edward said it or I said it, but because inspired biblical authors have said it. God produces our holiness. We act our holiness. God is the author of the miracle. We are the actors of the miracle of sanctification. How does the Bible teach this? And secondly, how do we experience this in daily life? Those are my two remaining questions. Let's start with the cross. God in Christ cancels our sins. Colossians 2.15. He canceled the record of debts that stood against us, nailing it to the cross. It's a magnificent verse. Colossians 2. God cancels our sins at the cross through faith alone. And then we conquer canceled sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Or to use doctrinal language, the enjoyment of justification precedes and is the foundation for the energy of sanctification. The enjoyment of justification, yes, my sins are canceled, is the foundation of my energy of sanctification by the Spirit. And it's crucial that we start here and that we not get this backward. Jarvis Williams began with this point, just underlining the importance of what he said. If you reverse that, sanctification and justification, you have another religion. It's not Christianity anymore. Charles Wesley taught us rightly to sing, he breaks the power of canceled sin. Right? When he said that, taught us to sing that magnificent line, he was teaching us this fundamental truth of how the cross relates to sanctification. The cross cancels sin, and then on the basis of the cancellation, we break its power. He breaks the power of canceled sin. There is no gospel, and it is unsingable to switch it around. He cancels the guilt of conquered sins. Is horrible heresy, another religion. He doesn't 
cancel the sins you've conquered. You conquer the sins he's canceled. That's the gospel. That's Christianity. That's the mystery of sanctification. Here's the way Paul puts it. Romans 6, verse 5. We have been united with Christ in a death like his. What does that mean? We have been united with Christ in a death like his. That means that when he died, he was dying in our place for our sins, bearing our condemnation such that in union with him, we died. And wasn't that a great line last night? You can't execute me twice. There are a lot of good lines last night. <laughs> oh my, we've been rich. When Christ died, we died. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. We reckon that Christ died for all, therefore all die. And when he died, our execution, our condemnation, our punishment is over. It happened 2,000 years ago, can't happen again. Our sins are canceled, punished, condemned already in Jesus. Now, that was Romans 6, 5. Here's Romans 6, 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Dethrone it. <laughs> Kill it. Because it's canceled. That's the order. Break the power of canceled sin. So the death of Christ in our place is always foundational to our defeat of sin. The basis of our conquering sin is Christ's canceling sin. Or to put it another way, the only sin that you can conquer is a pardoned sin. The only sin that you can conquer is a pardoned sin. Or to say it one, one other way, the pursuit of sanctification can only happen on the foundation of justification. If we try to defeat an uncanceled sin, which billions of people are trying to do every day, make their life a little better without Jesus. If you try to defeat an uncanceled sin, a sin that's not already covered by the blood of Jesus, you will make yourself your own savior. You will nullify the doctrine of the justification of the ungodly. And you will set yourself on a path to suicide. Despair. It won't work. And God did never mean it to work. He set it up another way. Here are two examples from the New Testament. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. You're bought. I bought you. You're mine. Glorify God with your body. See the order? Or here's another one. That's 1 Corinthians 6.20. This is Ephesians 4.32. Forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Not the other way around. God forgave you. It's what the cross is about. So, beyond putting to death unforgiveness and forgive one another, you're forgiven. Forgive. That's the order. Canceling sin precedes conquering sin. When the cross cancels our unholiness, 
It doesn't make the battle for holiness superfluous. It makes it possible. And in the end, it makes it totally successful. So, now we find ourselves loved and totally accepted, totally forgiven, justified, adopted, wonderfully secure, with profound assurance of salvation. And in the midst of that assurance, God says, Pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. So in the middle of this unspeakably sweet security and assurance that my sins are canceled and I'm loved and accepted and justified and adopted, The Bible says to me, his child and saint, pursue holiness, because if you don't have it, you'll never see him. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Luke 13, 24. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 4. In other words, conquering canceled sin is essential to be finally saved. Conquering canceled sin is essential to be finally saved. Not because your canceled sins could ever be uncanceled, but because the will to cancel sin and kill, the will to kill sin is the necessary sign that it's canceled. Let me say that again. Killing sin and pursuing holiness is essential for final salvation. Not to have that holiness is not to finally be saved. And this is true and spoken to the saints of God, not because any sins could ever be uncanceled, but because the will to kill sin is the sign that sins are canceled. If you don't want to kill your sin, you're not a Christian. When when uh, Paul raised the objection in the hypothetical objector, shall we sin that grace may abound since it's all free grace? Romans 6, 1. His answer was, dead men don't sin. Now, you know I'm not speaking perfectionistically. You know that, don't you? The thief on the cross was saved. And he did maybe one good work in all of his life. But it was real. And it testified to the reality of his justification. That's all that's needed. Is a holiness that testifies truly. I'm his. So the question now before us is, how do you go about pursuing the holiness without which no one will see the Lord? How do you pursue it? How do we strive to enter through the narrow door? How do we keep the commandments? How do we dethrone sin? Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies. How do we dethrone sin? How do we kill it? That's the question now. And there's a sequence of passages that I'm going to follow that make the answer, I think, gloriously clear and 
gloriously thrilling for the way God has called us to do this. Let's start with Romans 8.13. This is really big. John Owen wrote the book, Mortification of Sin, on the basis of this one verse because of how important it is, and I recommend that book to everybody very highly, The Mortification of Sin by John Owen. Here's what the verse says. If you live, so he's talking to the assured, happy, secure believers in Romans 8, the great 8. No more secure place in the Bible than Romans 8. No greater assurance of salvation anywhere in the Bible than in Romans 8. And in the great 8, Paul said, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So embedded in the great eight is a warning. If you surrender to the flesh, if you decide you don't want to make war on sin anymore, I'm done fighting. I'm just going to give myself over to the desires of the flesh. You will perish. Doesn't matter what your church history has been. Doesn't matter how many cards you signed, aisles you walked, prayers you prayed. You will perish. Because your sins were not canceled and you're not in union with Jesus. People in union with Jesus don't quit fighting. What's the alternative to that sad end? But, middle of the verse, Romans 8, 13, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live. So my first answer to the question, how do you pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord? How do you strive to enter by the narrow door? How do you dethrone and kill sin? You do it, verse 13 says, by the Spirit. I thought last night one critique of this conference might be the Holy Spirit didn't get his share. So he's getting it now. <laughs> if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And we'll come back to what that means and how you do it in just a moment. But just lock that one down. How do you kill sin? How do you dethrone sin? How do you break the power of cancel sin? Short answer, by the Holy Spirit. A lot of questions raised there, but there's the first answer. Now let's put another text beside that one, which says the same thing another way. This is Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where this whole conference got started last week year, last spring, I suppose. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's where I got the title to this conference, Act the Miracle. Work out your salvation. The, the word work out here, kater gadzeste, means Produce it. Bring it about. Effect it. Listen to these uses just to give you a flavor. Romans 5.3, suffering produces endurance. 
Romans 7, 8, sin produced in me covetousness. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, this affliction is producing in us a weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 7, 10, worldly grief produces death. James 1, 3, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's this word over and over again. Kater gods is there. Produce your salvation. Bring it about. That's scary. That's heretical almost. It's just biblical. It's what the Bible says to do. And Peter O'Brien, in his commentary on Philippians, uses these words. He says it means pursue it with continuous, sustained, strenuous effort, unquote. So as dangerous as the language is, and we must be careful when we hit upon dangerous language, it's here and we must come to terms with it. Bring about your salvation, produce your salvation, effect your salvation with continuous, sustained, strenuous effort. Now, to clarify, when it says salvation, most of us probably tend to jump immediately to the conclusion that all is meant here is the big final event of whether we make it or not to heaven. I doubt it. You know, salvation means deliverance, and it's the whole process. And I think here in the context... He doesn't just mean make sure your final salvation happens. That's true because sanctification is an essential step towards that. Rather, I think he means work out your salvation from sinning. Act your deliverance from sins. Act your victory, act your dethroning of sin, act your killing of sin. Work out your being saved from this impatience. Work out your act of deliverance from anger and resentment and fear of man and discouragement and self-pity and self-promotion and hardness of heart and envy and moodiness and sulking and indifference to suffering and laziness and boredom and passiveness and lack of praising others and lack of joy in Jesus. Save yourself from those things. Produce a deliverance from those. When they start to rise, kill them, dethrone them, be engaged in your sanctification. That's what I think he means. Work the miracle. So Romans 8.13 said, do this, put sin to death by the Spirit. Philippians 2.12 says, bring about your salvation from sinning because God is the one working in you to will it and work it. This should be breathtaking. The creator of the universe in me Producing a willing, producing a working, which I get to act. Awesome. I mean, facing any temptation, picture it, whether it's pornography or impatience or tooting a horn in traffic or going over the speed limit or saying something crappy to your wife or whatever it is, at that moment, you are on the brink of having the creator of the universe work in you a killing of that temptation so that when you act that miracle, God Almighty did that. You, if, you, if you ever wonder why the words fear and trembling are used here, you know, <laughs> I used to read that and think it primarily meant, well, you might not succeed, you better be afraid, you know, or something like that. If you track down that phrase, fear and trembling, 
It's just generally used where God is present. If God is near you, you tremble. You do. It's like, oh, God is here. And guess what? He's here to work miracles in you. He's here to kill your sin, not you. And therefore, the, the fear and trembling is like you have when you're in a cable car 10,000 feet above some Swiss valley. Like, wow, this cable could break. No, 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 no. Just relax and enjoy the scenery. <laughs> God is in your heart. I mean, be amazed. Would you please be amazed tomorrow morning that God wants to kill your laziness? God in you. So by the Spirit in Romans 8, 13, and because God is in you at work to will and work his good pleasure in Philippians 2, 12, I'm saying that's the same. That's the same thing. Now the question is, <laughs> this is a straight line. We're moving on here. The next question is, how do you tap into that? Okay, you just said, you just said the Spirit is the means by which you do it, and the God working in you is the means by which you do it, but what am I supposed to do? What's it like? How do I tap in? How to plug into the socket? Well, practically, what are you talking about tomorrow morning? That's the next question. When it says, by the Spirit, we kill sin or pursue holiness, or because God is at work in us, we act the miracle. Here's my answer to this question. Galatians 3, 5. I don't think it could be clearer. I just, this is why I'm so excited about this message. This message to me is just clear. I hope it's clear to you. How these questions are answered in the New Testament are clear. It's clear what we're supposed to pursue in holiness. It's clear that sins have to be canceled. It's clear that we're supposed to break the power of canceled sin. It's clear that we're supposed to do it by the Spirit. And now listen to how clear this is. This is Galatians 3, 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? No, or by the hearing of faith? Yes. So what's the answer to how you tap into the supply of the Holy Spirit coming into your life to will and to work his good pleasure? Miraculously, answer, by the hearing of faith. That's the answer. Whatever it means, that's the answer. <laughs> uh, so we got other questions to ask, right? We're still on the line. We're not going to leap to any lily pad here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so hearing with faith is how the Holy Spirit is supplied to us and works miracles among us. That's what I want, all right? I'm supposed to kill this sin, about to be tempted to do something I shouldn't do, and the Bible says, by the Spirit, kill it. So of the Spirit, kill it. And now I want to know, okay, Holy Spirit, you're going to somehow do that. How do I engage you? And the answer is not with works of the law. There's no bartering here. There's no earning here. There's no negotiation here. There's no payment here. There's what he calls hearing of faith. Now, what I think that means is that we are sanctified. We experience the power of the Holy Spirit to kill our sin by faith in future grace or faith in all that God promises to be for us in Jesus 
because of what he did on the cross. In other words, the way you tap in to the power of God for the miracle of sin-killing sanctification is by hearing, okay, here's the hearing part, hearing a blood-bought promise concerning you in your situation. I hear it. Now, that means that's why you have to get up and read your Bible in the morning and have some promises in your head, some daggers in your, in your arsenal. So you hear, reading your Bible, quoting it to you, in your memory bank. Somebody, this is why I exhort one another every day as long as it's called a day because some days I forget and you remember and you need to tell me what I need to know and trust, horizontal dimension of sanctification. So I hear, I hear a promise of God for all that he will be for me in Jesus concerning this situation I'm in right now, this dangerous temptation situation. And then I believe it of faith, hearing of faith. I believe the promise. I believe what he's saying about my situation, about me. And believing get this, is a receiving. Most of us are okay with that. To as many as believed and received, John 1, 12, believing and receiving, same. So believing is a receiving. I, re I receive the promise. I receive what you're promising me. And the receiving is not a receiving, it's trash. It's a receiving as treasure. I receive your promise as my treasure. That's what faith is. Faith is a receiving of what God's telling you he is for you with treasuring. You value it. And my argument is that faith of hearing is the channel through which the Holy Spirit breaks the power of canceled sin. The Holy Spirit awakens and moves through that faith in God's promise. And that's the power to break canceled sin. It dethrones sin. Sin loses its compelling grip because Faith has embraced the promise of God as a superior satisfaction, a superior treasure than what sin is promising you. Sin is promising you, if you lie about your tax form, you have, you know, a few more hundred dollars. That will make life go better for you. That's a lie. That's a, an, an enticement. Lying will will make things go better. That's a lie. It's an enticement. It offers a pleasure to you. At that moment, you receive the promise from Hebrews 13. Keep your life free from the love of money. For God has said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Therefore, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. No, I'm going to tell the truth. And Satan falls. And sin is defeated and dethroned. How? I believe a promise. God is more valuable. That promise is true. I have a treasure 10,000 times better than a few hundred dollars by lying. Give me a break, Satan. You can do better than that. <laughs> this is the way it works. This is the way you put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. That is, by the hearing of faith in the promise of God that he and his future are more satisfying than anything sin could offer you. Now, let me illustrate with some very powerful passages what that looks like. Um, I don't know of another book in the Bible that makes this plainer. What I'm trying to say right now that makes this plainer than the book of Hebrews. 
So I invite you to turn to Hebrews 11. Let me do a little summary here so you can see the line we're on. God has appointed us to be holy from eternity. Holiness is bringing our lives into conformity to the infinite worth of God's transcendent Trinitarian fullness so that our lives reflect the value of God over everything else. On the process towards that final fullness at the end of the age, he canceled sin. On the basis of that canceled sin, he calls me to break the power of canceled sin. Kill it. Dethrone it. As a means to that end, he said, do it by the Spirit. Do it because I'm at work in you to do it. You act the miracle. I author the miracle. And when we ask, how do you get into that power? How do you tap in? He said, does he who supplies the Spirit to you do so by works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Answer, by the hearing with faith. So here's where we are in our, in our line. We're in a the line. They're right there. That's where we are. What does that look like? Tapping into the power of the Spirit to kill sin by faith in a promise. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, defines faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So I'm just going to settle it. I'm saying I love this message because it's clear. What's faith? The assurance of things hoped for. Faith is future-oriented. You promise me something, I'll believe it. Now faith, that doesn't mean faith has no backward glance to the cross where all of that was bought. It's just not the focus. When you talk about killing sin, which is what chapter 11 is about, by faith Abraham went out and obeyed, this is what it means. By faith, Abel offered the right sacrifice. By faith, Sarah gave birth. By faith, Samson. By faith, by faith. The way all these people did acts of righteousness, holiness is this faith. This faith. Don't bring anything else in right now. Just that faith. The assurance of things hoped for. Or look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So what is faith? It's the assurance of things hoped for. Like what? Reward. God and all that he promises to be for us. You don't please God at all if you don't want him as your reward. Faith is a receiving, a treasuring, an embracing of all that God promises to be for you in Jesus. That's the meaning of faith in Hebrews 11, which is defined that way, not only because it's true, but because it works to bring about what we're after here. So let's look at one or two illustrations. And oh, I love these illustrations. I want to be this way so bad. Let's look at Moses, and then we'll look at the early church. So get an old, an old experience of this in the Old Testament, then get a new experience of this in the New Testament. So chapter 11, verse 24 to 26. By faith, Moses... Now, let me just make sure you know what we're doing here, because there may be a fog in your head right now. I am trying to look and see what it looks like experientially in your head and in your heart, when you are, by the hearing of faith, experiencing the power of the Spirit to pursue holiness and kill sin. I want to know, show me, Bible, show me. I don't want anything ethereal here. I want this afternoon, over lunch, over nap, over evening, over going to Wheaton on Tuesday. I want nitty-gritty, hour-by-hour clarity about how to kill sin and pursue holiness. There's only vagueness here. That's what I'm after. So I'll start over again. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused. He's doing stuff now. He's putting something to death here. He refused 
to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now he's choosing, embracing something. Choosing, rather, to be mistreated. I mean, this is a miracle. You don't do this. This is a miracle. Choosing to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the, the reproach of Christ greater wealth. This is crazy. Wonderful, beautiful, glorious, holy. He considered the reproach of the Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Why? For he was looking to the reward, which now we've seen from verse 1 and verse 6 means because he was believing the promise. He had the assurance of things hoped for called reward in verse 6, called reward here in verse 26. So how does the Holy Spirit kill sin for Moses? How does it produce this beautiful holiness? Here, you have a choice, Moses. Here's the house you grew up in, the most powerful house in the world probably, at least in the nation. And you can have it all. All the pleasures of Egypt, all the power of Egypt, because your mother, you know, adopted mother, is, is the daughter of the king. And so that's one option that you could have. And then you could lead a people who are going to make your life miserable for 40 years. <laughs> and he chooses to lead a people. You love your church, guys? Dr. Pastors, you love your church. By faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He did it by faith, which is defined at the end of verse 26 as he was looking to the reward. Faith embraces the promise of what God will be for us in the Messiah and is satisfied by it so fully that when it looks at the pleasures of Egypt, it says, garbage. That's a quote from Philippians 3.9. It looks at the pleasures and says, fleeting. It looks at the reproach and says, treasure. That's a new man. That's a new creation. The Holy Spirit's at work in that man, and he's acting a miracle. I want to be that man. I want to act that miracle every day of my life until I'm saved to sin no more. And I'll bet you do too. Here's the illustration of the early church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. You can turn back there with me. Hebrews 10, 34. How did they kill the sin of fear and greed and selfishness? How did they act the miracle of compassion and risking their lives and all their property in order to visit their friends in prison? And the answer is, by faith in future grace, by looking to the reward, by the assurance of things hoped for. So let's read it. Verse 34. You had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. So these people are as strange as Moses because nobody rejoices when their house is trashed and graffiti is written all over it. Christians go home. and Nobody does that unless 
The Holy Spirit is working a miracle and you're working, you're acting the miracle. And that's the miracle we want to act. That's what it means to be a Christian. You had compassion on the on, the, in, on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew, okay, here comes the tapping into the power, you knew that you had a better possession and an abiding one. You knew you had a reward. You were looking to the reward. You had the assurance of things hoped for. You're banking on future grace. And that was the power by which you said, let's go to the prison, and if they trash our houses, we'll just sing, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abide still, this kingdom is forever. Let's go, let's do this. This is beautiful act. This is holiness in action. Yeah, yeah, let's fill this city with that. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Answer, he pours the Spirit out to work miracles among you by hearing with faith. And they heard a promise. What promise do you think they heard? Hmm. If I stayed in the book of Hebrews to get my answer, I'd probably... Say Hebrews 13, 5, one I quoted already. Keep your life free from the love of money. For God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, I can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I'm not going to love money. I'm going to love people. That, that may be the one they listened to. They heard. They heard. And then they believed. And then they went to the prison. And their houses were trashed. And they rejoiced that they were able to have God be holy. But I don't. I think it might have been another promise. Because notice that last couple of phrases in verse 34. You yourselves knew that you had a better possession, so better than all the stuff they're going to trash, and an abiding one. So it's bigger and better and it's longer. And when I hear that, I think of another promise, namely Psalm 1611. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. And those two promises correspond precisely to the, they had a better possession and an abiding one. So whether whether that's the one specifically that they had in their mind, you know, this is the way it works. A group of people get together, they're going to decide, a husband and wife maybe, going to decide if they're going to do something risky here for Jesus. They sit down, they start reading their Bibles. God makes something leap off the page like a Psalm 16, 11 says, we've got a treasure and his name is Jesus and it's greater and longer than any treasure we could have here. And I'll just tell you, last night as I was doing my little underlining here to get ready for today, this is the point where I said, why don't you stop here and make sure that they feel the force of this, because some of these people came here afraid to do what God wants them to do, and I mean to release them in this service. Some of you are in your 60s, like me, and you know there's something exciting in front of you, and you're scared. Some of you are 20, and you know there's a tough decision in front of you that would be glorious if you took it, and scary and painful, and fear, and greed and selfishness are looming like big lions in the path, just like they were for these folks. If we go to the prison and visit our friends, they'll know we're Christians. And if they know we're Christians, the same fate that befell them may befall us. And what about our kids and our couch? And my grandmother's French piece and grandfather's clock. He wants to say something right now to you from this text. And I don't know what it is, but you may hear it. And on and on we could go, but I'll stop. On and on we could go looking at promise after promise after promise connected to obedience after obedience after obedience so that 
the Holy Spirit is released in power time after time after time, and human beings act miracle after miracle after miracle called holiness. And it is so beautiful. This kind of people who go to the prison, or a Moses who signs on to love a people for 40 years who hardly ever give him any thanks at all, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's what the world is dying to see. Holiness like that. So let's do a recap and stop. Let's go back to where we started. The meaning of holiness, the beauty of holiness in God's children is the harmony, the concord between our lives and the infinite worth of the transcendent fullness of God. God is infinitely valuable in all that He is, high, transcendent, lifted up, self-existing in Trinitarian fellowship and fullness, infinitely valuable, and our lives are being brought into conformity to that. That's holiness that conformity, that harmony, harmony, that concord between God's value and our thoughts and feelings and, and actions. And on the way to that final beauty that fills the earth, he is canceling sin once for all in Jesus Christ. And then he's calling us to break the power of canceled sin. You've died with Christ, dethrone sin, Romans 6. And he's calling us to do it by the Spirit. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Or to say it a different way, he's calling you to do it by banking on the fact that God is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. Believe that. He's calling us to tap into that power, that miracle authoring power by believing. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law? No, but by hearing with faith, yes. Hearing a promise, believing it, receiving it, embracing it as a superior treasure because of all that God is for us in Jesus to anything sin might offer. And the Holy Spirit is awakening and moving through that act of treasuring called faith such that the power of canceled sin is broken. And you're free. You get a foretaste of the freedom of the glory of the children of God that will one day cover the earth. Now, do you see how this grand process of sanctification is leading to the predestined glory where the beauty of holiness will fill the earth. God has ordained that all obedience, all Christian obedience, be the obedience of faith, obedience that flows from the embrace of the supreme value of God. Do you see how he has set it up in such a way that every single act of obedience in the Christian has as its core a performance of the soul called faith, which by its very nature is in accord with the infinite value of the Trinitarian transcendence of God. And therefore, since God has ordained that all obedience be obedience by the hearing of faith, all that obedience will reflect the supreme value, the worth, the infinite worth of the transcendent Trinitarian fullness of God. And therefore, the world will be filled with the holiness of God and of 
his people because it will be filled with the obedience of faith. There will be in the soul of all saints and there will be in all their outer action a perfect harmony with the infinite worth of God's transcendent fullness. Within, there will be satisfaction. This is what faith is, a being satisfied, a receiving, a satisfying all that God promises to be for us. So within, you have faith, which is the essence of holiness because it's in perfect accord with the value of God, treasuring it, being satisfied by it. And outside, you have the fruit of that faith, namely, a life of beautiful love or holiness. The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. That is, the earth will be filled with the beauty of holiness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray now that you would apply the cancellation of our sin to every person in this room through faith alone. Then I pray that you would awaken in every one of us a profound, blood-bought resolve to break the power of canceled sin. And then I pray that you would grant us to see that this is by the Spirit and by God at work within us to will and to do His good pleasure. And then I pray that you would grant that we would see that it is by the hearing of faith that the Holy Spirit is active in this miracle-working sanctification. And so grant to us faith. May we be a people who embrace the infinite value of the transcendent fullness of God. I pray this in his name.